Hello, everyone. All right. I, uh, I'm Marcus Wassmer, the uh, engineering director for graphics here at Epic Games. And today I'm here to talk to you guys about a massive year-long project from the rendering and uh, console VR and mobile teams to kind of refresh the, uh, the rendering pipeline of UE4. Uh, so let's, let's get right into it. Uh, so first of all, why did we want to spend a whole year doing this when we could have been making cool features instead? Uh, the main reason is, you know, the, the trend in games lately has been uh, people wanting to throw bigger and bigger games at the, at the world. So you're talking massive view ranges, super high detail. You'd like seamless interiors in your open world games. Uh, for, you know, just content creation purposes, you also, uh, it's also very handy to do a modular construction. So you can have, like, a bunch of pre-built pieces that can be either procedurally placed or, or hand-built uh, to keep like content creation costs down. And we do expect that uh, you know, in the future, more dynamic lighting and shadowing techniques are going to require uh, more mesh passes uh, to, to make them work. So bottom line, we need to be able to execute a lot of draws as fast as possible. Uh, and then secondarily, whoop, there we go. Uh, secondarily, there are some upcoming technologies that need to operate on the entire scene, not just the visible set like you kind of do with normal first-person rendering. Uh, so for example, DXR ray tracing technology, uh, you need to build the shader binding table for the entire scene, not just the visible set. So for example, if you're, say, you're shooting a reflection ray off of a shiny surface somewhere in the world, and it bounces around behind you somewhere out of, out of scene, uh, when the ray hits something, it still needs to be able to evaluate the full artist-created material uh, so that it can properly calculate um, you know, lighting for the reflection and, and shadowing and whatnot. Uh, which means that you can't really cull anything out uh, with visibility or occlusion culling. You just got to keep all that stuff around. So literally everything needs to know all shader bindings at all times. Uh, we're also you know, hoping in the future to move to a GPU-driven culling system as opposed to the current uh, hardware occlusion-based one. Uh, so in this case, the CPU doesn't really know anything about the occlusion culling state, and it's got to prepare uh, more draws without knowing visibility uh, for the GPU to fill in. It, it's, it's kind of another talk to, to discuss the, the different uh, APIs, methods of doing that. But uh, anyway, point being, we must not be preparing the entire scene's draws every frame. It's just not efficient enough to do uh, in real time. Uh, so how do we get there? How do we get lots and lots of draws and uh, you know, also not be updating the entire scene every frame for these things? Uh, so first thing, you know, one main component is going to be a draw call merging framework, uh, also known as, as instancing. instancing. Uh, so this is something you can do slightly differently depending on what RHI or API you're using. Um, RHI is an epic acronym for like rendering hardware interface. Uh, so we have one implementation RHI for you know, DX11 and 12 uh, Vulkan, et cetera. Uh, so specifically, like on D3D11, a lot of you may be familiar with uh, just kind of normal hardware instancing with uh, draw index primitive on DX11. And when you make draws like this, uh, you know, each individual uh, draw that happens as part, of the, as part of the instance draw can only really differ by the instance ID that you get in the shader. Uh, there's no opportunity in the D3D11 API to like, change, your, change your shader parameters in between or change your rendering state or anything like that. Uh, so which means if you want to do draw call merging, uh, when your renderer is going through and doing draws, you can't keep setting parameters uh, constantly as you go from draw to draw. Uh, instead, you have to upload uh, all this data to you know, some sort of, some sort of GPU-based buffer uh, that you can index into based on the instance ID and primitive ID that you can get. Um, and then the second thing to do to, uh, to meet these goals is much more aggressive uh, caching of the render data that's required. Uh, so for a lot of things in the scene that don't, uh, that don't move, like your static mesh components, uh, you can do a lot of work when you add things to the scene uh, that the, the engine currently does not do. Basically, you want to allow your RHI implementation to pre-build as much data as humanly possible so that you don't have to do it every frame. Uh, so this includes things like your shader binding table entry for DXR, uh, your full uh, graphics PSO state for like DX12, 
um, you know, and, and all of your shader bindings uh, that you want to grab at, at the scene time instead of every frame. Uh, so you can remove a lot of overhead from the renderer in this way. Uh, before we talk about what we changed uh, in the mesh drawing pipeline, uh, we're first going to take a look at how the current one works. Uh, I don't know how many people have delved deep into the guts of the whoop, private rendering code, but uh, let's take a quick look. Uh, so first, uh, you might find that in the UE4 renderer, uh, it works on a split game thread and render thread architecture, where the render thread uh, can be like a frame behind the game thread. And to keep all the data access thread safe, uh, we actually make a proxy object that lives on the render thread to represent all of your game thread objects. Um, and this is done with just with the primitive scene proxy class. So for example, if you had like a skeletal mesh component in a scene, it would have its own uh, primitive scene proxy with its own copy of the data on the render thread that can be safely accessed. Um, and then the, the process of turning this into something that can be drawn, uh, for dynamic things, you know, uncached things, there's a function called get dynamic mesh elements. And what this does on a, on a given proxy is generate uh, what we call an, a mesh batch. I'm going to leave the Fs off because it's kind of a, a tongue twister. You guys can read them. Uh, so what the mesh batch does is it completely decouples the uh, scene proxy implementations from the pass logic, the pass drawing logic. So uh, for example, uh, skeletal meshes and landscape and cascade and Niagara all have different ways of dynamically generating the data for drawing that the, you know, the final rendering code really doesn't need to know about. All it needs to know is, you know, where are my vertex buffers? Where are my shaders? Where are my parameters? It doesn't really care how they were generated them. Um, so the mesh batch has everything that any pass would need to find out the bindings that are required. Um, so if you're not familiar, the, we have multiple geometry passes, like your base pass that uh, renders the gbuffer data, uh, shadow depth passes, uh, velocity generation passes, et cetera, et cetera. Those all use slightly different shaders and slightly different bindings, uh, but the mesh batch uh, contains all the data required for, for any such pass. Uh, and then the other thing is the proxy, uh, the proxy object doesn't really know what passes it might be rendered in. Uh, it's just kind of there for the renderer to decide which passes it should be in. All right. So <clears throat> You know, once we've got our, you know, we know how to generate a batch, uh, then to actually go about drawing them, uh, we have a, you know, like a like a draw list class that just has the, the list of all the all the proxies and batches, and we have what's known as a drawing policy. So the drawing policy is just um, just a class full of code that knows how to draw a particular pass. Uh, so again, like the base pass or a shadow pass or a, a velocity pass, that sort of thing. Uh, and then these drawing policies, combined with the batches and uh, the traversal of the draw list, end up generating our cross-platform um, RHI command list, which is then finally translated into the actual D3D or Vulkan or Metal or whatever commands uh, that are required. Um, those last two bubbles there are probably a, a completely separate talk, so we'll gloss over those for the moment. Uh, so taking a closer look at the traversal and, and policy stuff, uh, you know, what, what the policy does then is it builds the complete pipeline state uh, there, which is the shaders plus all your graphic state, like your rasterizer state, uh, your depth state, stencil state, et cetera, et cetera. And then the more complex thing to do is to gather up all the shader bindings, uh, all the shader parameters for the shaders. You have to, you know, walk through the material chain to find out what data is on your material instance, uh, anything inherited from the parent, uh, gather data for the, um, you know, the vertex shader from the vertex factories, Taken any any global data from the scenes and the views, kind of gather it all up and make sure you can set everything properly, um, you know, for your final draw. Uh, so it's been working for four years or so. Like, why do we want to change it? Um, well, there's, there's a few reasons. Uh, first of all, the kind of existing draw list that we have uh, ends up using bit arrays for visibility, and these bit arrays are over all objects in the scene. And this has the unfortunate property of having some parts of the renderer uh, have performance scale with the total amount of objects in the scene, not with just with what's visible in front of you. Uh, this is not a good property that you want to have for large open worlds. 
Uh, secondly, the existing code, or 421 and prior code, uh, has completely separate static and dynamic paths uh, for generating draws, which means we can't sort static, uh, static objects with dynamic objects, which is uh, unfortunate sometimes. Uh, just to, like from a, working with the code perspective, uh, these lists are templated by shader permutation. Uh, and we do have you know, uh, a significant number of these between like different skylight parameters and lighting and shadowing parameters. So it just kind of makes the code a little ugly to work with. At, that part doesn't really make much difference to the end user. Uh, and then finally, there's only a single hard-coded frequency for state sharing. At, what this means is basically we can only do instancing in ways that were hard-coded by a programmer um, or a content creator, which is you know, not ideal for a nice automatic system. Um, so that's really the big point. Uh, the, the existing design just completely prevents effic efficient draw merging, which is one of our main goals. Uh, the drawing policies, uh, the code was just too tightly coupled to the existing uh, draw list implementation and had to go. Um, so let's take a look at the changes we made to, to fix some of these problems. So f first off, uh, the existing static mesh draw list and drawing policy code is all completely gone, just straight up deleted from the engine. Uh, if anyone has their own uh, like private local changes that you've made for your games to add uh, custom mesh passes or, or modifications to these things, this might be the first place where you run into trouble uh, upgrading your game into 4.22, which is really one of the main motivations for giving this talk, is to give everybody a heads up. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully, with the rest of the talk, you'll know how to, uh, to fix that problem. But uh, you know, I'm available for questions if necessary. Uh, so anyway, uh, instead of that, we've replaced those things with the concept of a mesh draw command uh, and a, like a processor to generate the commands and some common code to, uh, to submit these commands. Uh, let's, let's take just a quick look at what is a draw command. So as opposed to a mesh batch, which has a lot of information about everything possibly necessary to render for any pass. Uh, a draw command is a much simpler object. It stores everything that you need to know to draw a mesh in just any, any particular pass. Uh, it's a full standalone description, meaning it's completely stateless. Uh, you can see a snippet of the code there. Um, but what this means is it, it's a data-driven design and that it's, it's shed its context in completely. These, these draw commands don't know where they came from. Uh, there is a debug pointer there. If you're in a development build and you hit a breakpoint, you can kind of poke through the, uh, the debug pointer and see where things came from. But you do not want to write code that relies on these things because they get compiled on a shipping build and, well, it just won't compile. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the fact that we're going stateless here with a small structure gives us some nice properties. Uh, first of all, it enables us to do more aggressive caching. Uh, because you have an object that is pass-specific, uh, you can kind of construct these things completely uh, when, you add, when you add them to the scene. Uh, so you can you know, gather all shader bindings and everything right there. This gets us closer to a uh, fully retained mode, where you know, we could potentially know uh, the full pipeline state object and shader bindings at load time. Uh, we're not quite there yet, because there's a few things that the current renderer needs to know based on what's in your level, uh, for example, whether there's a stationary skylight or not. Uh, but it brings us back a little bit closer to, to, to early in the load time. And this allows us to do like robust uh, draw call merging or dynamic instancing on DX11, because we just have the, all the state right there, and it's not, uh, the code's not dependent on anything, any materials or anything from the higher level. Uh, you can just compare the state, and the back end of the render doesn't have to care where the draw commands came from. It can just sort them and merge them. Uh, based on what's actually used. So we'll take a little bit closer look at that later. Um, so how do you generate uh, a draw command? So for example, if you wanted to make your own custom, your own custom pass. Uh, well, you have to implement a mesh pass, mesh pass processor, uh, which is more or less similar to the old drawing policy code. Uh, so let's take a quick look at that. Uh, so these guys build one or more draw commands from a batch. Uh, you might ask why there might be more than one. Uh, you know, when, you're doing, uh, when you're doing this add to scene time, you need to make a draw command for each LOD of your mesh, uh, for example, because you want to do LOD selection later, but you don't want to generate the commands. 
Uh, and then certain geometry types might generate more than one command. Um, for example, like a Niagara particle system could potentially generate, you know, well, any number of any number of draws for a given system. Uh, so these, uh, the processor is going to select the do the final selection of the shader to use, and it's going to collect all the the shader bindings um, from the various locations. Uh, so just take a quick look at a code snippet. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. Uh, they're kind of hard to read on the slides, and well, the code's out in 422 preview, so anybody can go go download it and have a play with it. Uh, but there's really the point is there's not really a whole lot of code that you need to implement to make a new mesh pass processor. Uh, you really only have to add like the one function for adding the adding the batch. Uh, so if we look at one that we implemented, uh, just like the standard uh, pre-pass depth pass, uh, there's a little bit of boilerplate here about uh, construction setting things up and adding the processor. Uh, so if you, we take a look at the uh, the add mesh batch function, this takes the batch, generates the commands. All this is really doing is deciding if this object really needs to be in your pass. Uh, so since this is the depth pass, we decided that uh, translucent objects should not write depth. So, you know, so we skip those. Uh, and then it wants to do shader selection out of the material. And then finally, uh, gather the shading bindings via this uh, mesh draw commands function down there. And that's coming up in a couple slides. But the nice property of that thing is it is shared amongst all, of the, pro all the mesh processors. So that's one of the reasons it's easy to make another one uh, a custom one if you would like to do so. And, and that's kind of it for a, a processor. If you compare against the old drawing policy code, uh, for example, the, the old depth uh, policy code versus the new processor, it's six times less code uh, to deal with. For the base pass, it's four times less. Uh, so it just, it's much easier to work with, and it's much easier to, to extend the engine um, on the new system. Uh, and then. This particular function is, is the main reason why it's easier, uh, because there's a single common um, draw commands function that kind of works for any processor if you pass it the right data. And this thing can um, collect all your shader bindings into, into a little structure for you. And it just, it just removes all the boilerplate. It makes things really easy. Um, kind of look at the, the old system here. You see that the old drawing policies would just directly set the parameters on the final command list. Whereas the new system works uh, more of a gather into the, uh, the new draw single shader bindings uh, function, which we also get to use uh, later when sorting and, uh, and doing draw call merging. Uh, that information was kind of lost in the previous system due to the bindings going directly onto the command list. Um, so after we have generated all of our batches, uh, we can now uh, sort them. And now in the new system, we can sort uh, both static and dynamic things together, because you have one single um, draw command representation for both static and dynamic draws. Uh, and you have one single uh, just array of the visible things, rather than the old scene-wide uh, arrays of, of things. Um, and then you can finally do submission, which is also a common function and we'll take a look at in a second. Uh, so. The nice thing about the new submission code is that it scales completely with the visible set. Like, like I mentioned, the previous passes generate just flat arrays of draw commands. Uh, so they don't have, you don't have to walk this bit array and like, check every single index anymore to see if it's visible or not. Uh, so being a flat array of just the visible stuff means it's really easy to parallelize. You can just literally evenly split the things in the number of threads that you want and kick it off, and you're going to get a pretty even amount of work, because every draw command is about the same it's basically the same cost to draw. Uh, one of the problems with the old system was any given uh, mesh batch was potentially not the same cost to draw. And since you had to walk the whole array to see how many things there were, you'd have problems like generating even amounts of work for your threads. So things are much nicer now. Uh, the code now is also side effect free. Like the mesh draw command is finalized. Uh, so it doesn't need any external data to do the drawing. Uh, if you would take a look at the 421 and earlier code, you'd see that some of the drawing policies would, uh, would look at some global state or want to modify some things or create some local stuff in line. Uh, and you just, it made, made certain uh, things hard to do in parallel rendering, and it's just not an issue anymore. Uh, and again, because the draw commands are combined, this, uh, this code works for any mesh pass uh, that you would like to implement, so making things easier again. 
Uh, another nice property that you get from the new common function is you get automatic state filtering above our command list level. Uh, so you might find that you know, certain draws aren't mergeable because you know, maybe uh, you know, one, one state changed in between that you couldn't handle. But a lot of the state between the draws might still be the same. Uh, and you might end up generating a lot of redundant uh, commands on the command list. Uh, that all kind of goes away if you use this function to do your draws, and uh, it reduces the load on the command list ex execution significantly, something like 20% and in, in, uh, something like Fortnite. Um, and then lastly, uh, you get very nice cache coherent traversal of these things. You just have flat, contiguous arrays of these small data structures. Uh, so it works really well on modern CPUs where you get um, you know, where cache coherence is very important. And you get nice uh, prefetch behavior from, from most modern CPUs as well when you have a flat array. Um, so keep things in contiguous memory. It's really important. All right. So let's take uh, a closer look at you know, what's actually necessary and why to, to cache the commands. Like, you know, we could, in theory, you know, generate these draw commands every frame, and we do for certain objects. Uh, but ideally, we want to you know, do as little generation work as possible. Um, and we can do this because the, the majority of, of game worlds are made out of modular static meshes. Uh, few games have everything moving around all the time, every frame. And many games also use um, uh, you know, modular pieces. You know, you know, for example, in Fortnite, you've got your player-built walls and things that are all basically uh, very similar and uh, could be merged. Uh, and in the old system, there was a lot of work uh, that was going on every frame uh, for these things that really didn't need to be done. So instead, we can do the full draw command generation for every pass in LOD uh, and just select the right ones to draw each frame, which is much faster than generating them. Uh, kind of the problem with any caching system is invalidation, right? Like if you cache something off and then some state changes uh, that's referenced by your draw command, it has to be invalidated. And you don't want to be in a situation where something that you're changing every frame uh, causes your draw commands to be invalidated, because then what's the point of caching them? Uh, so to solve this, uh, we kind of leverage uniform buffers as the uh, end direction to make this possible. Uh, so a, a good example for this is the view uniform buffer that the renderer uses to upload like uh, projection matrix uh, data for the camera. and. Various other things that are just kind of seeing global uh, related to your current camera. Uh, so 421 cold and older would just literally generate a new view uniform buffer every frame um, and fill it with data. And this meant that every draw call that you had had a new pointer that it had to you know, point to, to to bind the view uniform buffer. Uh, for something like DXR, where you have to update literally every object in the scene with a new pointer every frame, this was terrible. Um, instead, what you can do is keep the same view uniform buffer pointer uh, every frame and simply update that data. This means that you can uh, cache your draw commands. They all point to the same view pointer that does not change. And you can just change that data. And it's significantly more efficient um, and lets you, lets you do caching. Uh, so you'll find now in 4.22, there's a new RHI function to do uniform buffer update. This was not available previously. Uh, and it, it just does what you have a uniform buffer. You can update the contents uh, at, you know, probably once a frame is good. But you can do it more if you want to. Uh, so in the process of, of, of dealing with this, uh, there's various uniform buffers in the, in the engine that uh, we go through this update process now. Uh, primitive uniform buffer to hold the uh, like transform state on your objects, stuff about your materials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one key thing that we had to change as part of the, wait, did I go backwards? OK, I think I lost the slide. We'll save that for later. Uh, so again, you know, anything uh, cached there has to be invalidated. Uh, it was mostly already handled in the engine because the old static draw list um, needed the same sort of val invalidation. Uh, again, Skylight's kind of the major one. When Skylight's coming in and out, you had to invalidate a lot of state. Um, and 
Yeah, you'll see that the important thing now, as opposed to the old system, is again that the shader bindings are now cached. Uh, this causes a lot of extra invalida invalidation cases that didn't used to be there, because we used to just set parameters every frame. Uh, now they're cached, and you have to be careful, like, you know, in the engine code. If you're extending the material system, for example, or something like that, and you're changing uh, shader binding states on things, uh, you might need to add a new invalidation function. Uh, and if you want to test it to make sure that you didn't mess up such an extension, there is a validation mode that you can enable and hopefully catch such issues uh, when they happen, like right at the collar that's causing the problem, rather than later in the middle of your game when things are flickering like crazy and you don't know why. That happened to us a few times. Um, <laughs> caching is also only supported for certain object types. Um, if you're familiar with uh, the UE4 Vertex Factory, this is just kind of our way of saying, um, what vertex shader are you using? So there's a vertex factory for just kind of static meshes that don't really change. There's one for skeletal meshes that do GPU skinning. There's one for things that do morph targets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so right now, we can do caching of draw commands only for local vertex factory, which is static meshes, that don't require a view. Um, so. Some of the vertex factories require a view uh, to do their work properly. Like, for example, landscape needs your current viewpoint to figure out uh, kind of its tessellation state and what it's going to draw. And unfortunately, when you need a view to do something like that, you can't cache the draw command ahead of time. It's just, you, you can't cache it for every possible view state, so you just have to generate it um, on demand. Uh, so that means we end up with uh, kind of three code paths for caching in the engine. Uh, there's like fully dynamic relevance where you know, we generate the mesh batch and the draw command every frame. This is something like Niagara. Um, we have static relevance, but you need the view. This is where we can cache the batch, but we cannot cache the draw command. So as mentioned just a second ago, something like landscape uh, goes down this path. And then finally, the new fast path uh, is Static objects where you don't need the view. So basically, static meshes are the most important uh, things in this list. So we can fully cache the batch and fully uh, cache the draw command. Uh, so if we now look at a kind of the high-level view of a frame with caching, you know, on add to scene time, when you unhide an object or load it into your scene, uh, generate the batch and the draw command, store it. Something like changing the skylight happens. Uh, you go ahead and invalidate it. Um, and then in init views, which is where the renderer um, basically does visibility calculations, you go ahead and compute your LOD, and you figure out which draw command goes with that LOD, add it to your visible list, and kind of carry on. And then you just walk your draw list, uh, or walk, walk your commands and draw them for a given pass. All right, so that's caching. We'll talk about merging quickly. Um, so on DX11, there's uh, really one path. There's the draw, draw instance indirect. Uh, and we can only change the instance ID in between draws, not state or bindings. And this is kind of the easiest one to implement and prove out the new pipeline works, because uh, most of the APIs uh, support the features necessary to making this work. Uh, DX12 and other more modern APIs uh, have execute indirect and other functions, which could allow us to do more merging than DX11 could. Uh, for example, execute indirect lets you change state in between your instance draws, which you can't do in DX11. Uh, but we have not implemented this path yet. That's kind of future work yet. Or if anyone wants to do it for me and make a pull request, uh, you know, I might want to be OK. Uh, <laughs> so if we take a look at the, uh, the dynamic instance thing, this is really easy to do with the draw commands. Um, now that we have all the state and just these flat arrays, we're not coupled to high level code anymore. It doesn't matter where the draw commands came from. More importantly, content creators don't have to opt into this. Uh, kind of the existing mechanisms, the instant static mesh component and the hierarchical instant static mesh component kind of specifically require uh, the content creation team to, to set things up for instancing in the first place, uh, which kind of limits its usability to, to just those things that are really, really important. Uh, with this system, it all happens kind of seamlessly on the back end for the things that it can happen on uh, automatically, which is a lot nicer. Um, one thing you, we had to avoid when doing this is that you, you don't want to be doing that full comparison uh, for all those states and shader bindings constantly every frame. That's kind of just as bad as doing it the old way. 
fortunately, uh, since we're caching the full draw commands for static stuff at add to scene time, we can put everything uh, into buckets um, based on their state so that we can look them up later quickly. So we just kind of uh, amortize the, the comparison cost up front. Uh, and then the, you know, because we have that data, the actual merging operation in the end is just a short data transformation on the, on the visible set. So any commands that are in the same state bucket that they got put into when they ride it to the scene, can, we just know they can get replaced with a single instanced uh, mesh draw command. Uh, so this makes the, the process of doing the merging uh, on the back end a, a lot faster and, and viable. Uh, so to actually be effective at doing this, you know, we have a system where it'll do it if it can. You have to make it so that it can. So we really have to get rid of our per draw shader parameters that we're changing in between each draw so that it can actually do the merging. Uh, so you'll see a lot of changes in the engine in 4.22 uh, around these type of things. Uh, we found a lot of parameters that were being set for draw were really uh, just kind of constant state across the whole frame. Uh, for example, like the, the debuffer decal textures and eye adaptation textures. Uh, you know, those, those pointers don't change across a frame. There's no reason to you know, make binding calls in between draws for them. Uh, so a lot of stuff like that was just moved out into uh, pass-wide or frame-wide uniform buffers, uh, which meant that we could have just, you know, the binding for those things is the same for all draws. If a draw wants to look up one of these debuffer textures, it, it can or cannot as it chooses, uh, but the binding is at least the same for, for everything. So you can do, still do merging. Um, so after you did that for the constant data, there, there still is a set of data that actually does need to change. Um, for example, like your primitive uniform buffer that holds the transform for your object. Well, obviously, every object still needs its own transform. Uh, and there's other things like you know, distance call fading. Each, each object might be in a different uh, state of fading. So how do we get rid of those uh, such that we still don't need to change any state in between the draws? Well, we can actually combine all of those different things into a single scene-wide unified buffer. So you can take every object's transform, for example, for the whole scene and put it into one uh, big GPU array that can be uh, dynamically indexed from there. And then you know, once you have removed enough of the uh, per-draw bindings, then you can finally do some merging. Uh, one thing you we'll find is that uh, there were a few of those different arrays. Uh, so we kind of made a common GPU T array implementation uh, that has dynamic resizing capabilities. Uh, this is not something that we want to like, completely regenerate every frame. Uh, so the render thread just kind of tracks uh, primitive, uh, primitive deltas and uses a, just a short compute shader to, to update only the little chunks that need to be updated uh, in every frame instead of the whole thing. Uh, all shaders must now access uh, primitive data with a primitive ID, uh, because not all of our vertex factories uh, support the, the caching. So uh, the mechanism for getting this data out is a little bit different. Uh, but as far as the code goes, like it's, it's hidden behind this new get primitive data function in the shader code. You just stick that in there. The, the code's really not that much different from the user perspective. And that'll get you to the right place and get the right data out. Um, again, only used by the supporting vertex factories, local vertex factory for static meshes, and it's abstracted away. It's okay, and some of you might be wondering if, for a given run of objects, you only know from the instance ID, say you draw 10 cubes in one instance draw call, the instance ID only tells you whether you're you know, 0 through 9. It doesn't actually tell you where in the giant scene-wide buffer you are. Uh, so something needs to give you that offset. Uh, one thing you could do is, you know, generate, uh, you, know, you know, bind your offset to the, to the draw, but that kind of defeats the purpose of moving all the stuff out to a global data in the first place, and you don't really want to do that. Um, fortunately, uh, the input assembler comes to the rescue. Uh, set stream source on vertex data accepts a dynamic offset that has nothing to do with uh, the actual shader bindings. So you can essentially uh, create a, ins a vertex stream at instancing frequency with the offsets for each of your draws, and then bind that to the input assembler uh, via set stream source for all your draws. 
And you can get that back out again uh, in the vertex shader and pass it down where, where necessary. And so far as I've seen, every API supports this functionality. Uh, and it was a nice win over, over other methods of uploading the offset data that you need to, to offset yourself into the scene buffer. OK, so let's actually look at some results. Um, these are some results from a GPU perf test scene that the, the Epic rendering team uses to kind of evaluate new features and performance improvements. Uh, it's basically just an extracted uh, small city from Fortnite that's put into a separate project, so it's uh, easier to, to kind of load and, and iterate on. It's also constant data, which is really nice. Uh, so when, between depth and base pass, uh, we ended up with around 2x uh, reduction in draw calls uh, of the new merging code versus the old code. Uh, you'll see that the base pass has a slightly less reduction factor just because it has more unique shaders. Um, in the depth pass, a lot of things kind of collapse to use the same uh, vertex shader and not have a pixel shader if, they're, if they don't have alpha testing. Uh, so that's why you see a little bit of difference there. Uh, but Fort GPU testbed doesn't really uh, kind of test the future of where we want to be with having lots and lots and lots of draw calls. Uh, so the simple programmer art solution to this is duplicate the scene three times, move it around a little bit, turn off distance culling, and just get like the maximum amount of, of draws possible for the thing. Uh, so in this kind of uh, best case scenario for merging, uh, the improvement ended up more like a 10x and 5x. So you see it's still significantly less on the base pass due to, to unique shaders. Um, so there are some performance gotchas here. Um, you will only get merging on things. You, you'll get merging on most uh, static mesh components that are duplicated unless uh, you have static lighting, where you have light maps with very small textures. Because if you end up with a case where you have to bind different light maps for each object, that's going to break merging. Uh, per component vertex colors will also break merging. So if you're using a lot of vertex painting to, uh, to paint data around your scene, uh, you'll find that we, we actually do still have to bind those per draw. So we can't instance things across um, vertex paint. Uh, the speed tree win node uh, is not currently merged. There's no technical reason why it couldn't. We just haven't done it yet. Uh, but it's something to watch out for. And then if anybody is still using kind of the old sparse volume lighting samples from baked lighting on movable objects, uh, that will also uh, keep your draws from merging. Uh, the newer volumetric light maps don't have that problem. You can, you can still use those and get merging. Uh, so that's kind of like draw call counts. We can look at some actual performance numbers. Uh, typically, or often, we use a PS4. It's kind of a, nice to have a constant piece of hardware that doesn't change. Um, many people can test on it. So first, I want to say that what I'm measuring here is the rendering thread draw pass cost only, not like the whole frame or anything. Um, but in the case of the single GPU perf test, we found uh, that for that section of code, we got about you know, a six and seven times reduction uh, in, in cost of, of drawing, which is uh, pretty good. And that's, that's a combination of merging plus the new uh, submission code just being more efficient and cache coherent and whatnot. Uh, so for our you know, kind of programmer art test of uh, duplicating this thing to emulate a larger world, it was more like 13 and 11 times faster between depth and base pass drawing, uh, which was a very great result. We were, we were, we were very happy with this on PS4. Uh, however, I, I, do want, I don't want everyone to leave here with the impression that your game is going to get thir times, 13 times faster. Uh, these are best case results. Uh, those scenes are very modular. Like they're built out of uh, you know, the, the, kind of the Fortnite walls and pieces. There's a pretty limited mesh variety in that scene. It's only showing mesh drawing speed up, not the full frame. So there's other parts of the render thread that are uh, expensive, like the visibility portion. They can still dominate your frame. Uh, and often, you know, we, we parallel, parallelized the renderer uh, a while ago. So if you don't really have enough draws for this drawing time to be on your critical path, it may not even be, it may not be that significant for you. Uh, the gains tend to become significant around 2,000 draw calls and greater is where you're going to maybe start seeing some benefits. Uh, in a views, cost has not changed and can still dominate the rendering thread when you have a lot of stuff. Um, also, a few things did not make it uh, through the process of updating the engine. Uh, so 
some things are just incompatible with the new retain mode and validation caching system. Uh, so like deferred uniform buffer updates uh, only for visible objects is kind of gone. Hopefully things are fast enough you won't notice it. Uh, if you have any custom expressions in your material editor, like there's a little custom expression mode where you can just type whatever HLSL you want. Uh, if, someone, if you were extracting uh, primitive data from it, you'll need to wrap it in the get primitive data function that I mentioned before. Uh, so if you load 422 and all your materials are broken, uh, this might be why. Take a look. Uh, the forward renderer, the, the desktop VR forward renderer, uh, now only supports a single global planar reflection. Um, so if you used to have, I don't know, five or 10 planar reflections in your scene and you were uh, relying on the engine to pick the closest one for you, unfortunately, that's uh, not supported anymore. And Again, like current UE4 projects might not be might not see benefits. This is kind of a future-looking thing. Um, specifically, if you're seen as like mostly unique materials, like if you have a different material on every object, we're not going to be able to merge anything, um, and kind of things. Like that. One key call out here is that the uh, mobile renderer currently does not uh, do the the merging right now. Uh, this just there's no particular technical reason. It just uh, didn't make it in time for 4.22. So this is planned for the future, uh, but just FYI if you're on mobile. Uh, so let's take a look at some testimonials. We had a few, a few people uh, pull the preview down and uh, share some results. Uh, so Joe Wintergreen here has a couple of his scenes that uh, shaved you know, 1,000 draw calls off of his uh, like 2,000 draw call frame. Uh, and then uh, the Shores Unknown guys here had uh, kind of a really, really uh, hefty, hefty scene here with about 18,000 draws, uh, kind of similar to the GPU perf test thing, um, but like real art and not just programmer art. And so you know, they saw pretty big reductions here. This scene actually went from 30 hertz uh, to 60 just from updating to 422, which is a uh, pretty cool result. We were, we were pretty happy to see that uh, it was succeeding in the wild. Uh, when it could. And with that, that's, that's kind of it. Uh, thanks to Joe and the Shores Unknown guys for letting me share their results. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, everyone. And if you think of something else, I'll be around the booth later. Thank you. <laughs>